This is the Bates Bobcast, our weekly podcast where we take a look at the week that was in Bates Athletics. My name is Aaron Morse, and this week we remember All-American thrower Peter Goodrich from the class of 1989, who died in the attacks of September 11, 20 years ago. Teammate Matthew Schechter shares his memories of Peter and tells us more about the Peter Goodrich Memorial Scholarship. Plus, we continue our fall sports previews with volleyball, field hockey, and football. That's coming up on the Bates Bobcast. The Peter M. Goodridge Class of 1989 Memorial Scholarship Fund was established and generously funded by his wife, Rachel Carr Goodrich, from the Class of 1990, and their friends and classmates to honor Peter after his death on board United Flight 175, the second plane to hit the World Trade Center towers on September 11, 2001. The fund honors the way Peter led his life with kindness, intellectual curiosity, and deep friendships. At Bates, he was an impressive member of the track and field team, graduated as a five-time All-American. Today, we talk with Peter's classmate and friend, Matthew Schechter, who won the indoor NCAA championship in the high jump in 1989, the same year Peter finished second nationally in the weight throw. P and I met on the track team our freshman year. Um, we both did field events, so uh, Pete was a thrower and I was uh, a high jumper. Um, so as you can imagine, with someone like Pete, uh, he was a double major in math and physics. Uh, his approach to the weight events was uh, very scientific and specific, which, um, you know, his technique was just incredible. And, you know, there were athletes he competed against that were, you know, much bigger, much stronger than Pete, um, but no one had better technique and he would work on it all the time, which really allowed him to get, you know, every inch out of, out of his frame relative to some of these uh, uh, bigger guys. And uh, obviously uh, he had tremendous success uh, in the, in the throwing events. Did he make a big first impression on you or did he kind of get to know him more slowly over time a little bit? Well, I think, you know, like anything freshman year, you're meeting a ton of people yeah. and uh, you know, uh, Pete, obviously sweetheart of a guy, just um, really engaged and really took time to, to, to meet people. I mean, he, uh, you know, we elected him as our, as the captain of the, of the track team, um, which is kind of a tribute because as you know, track's a pretty big team. So um, to have uh, someone like Pete as your leader, it says a lot about uh, his personality and, and, uh, and how much respect that the team had for him. Great. Tell me a little bit about being on the track team, you know, in the late eighties, what was it like? How close were the guys? And of course, you know, Walt Slavinsky being the head coach competing for him. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't have an analog to it, right. You know, I only know what I know, but yeah. I can tell you that, you know, our team was super close. Uh, you know, we still stay in touch to this day. I'm really close friends to, uh, with Craig Geike. Um, he was a runner on the team, uh, and his son's now a freshman at Bates, uh, you know, from the weight guys, we had uh, Scott Agababian, Joe Dever, Butch Beckman, you know, to name a few. Um, and of course, we were, as you hinted at, we were led by the late, great Walter Slavinsky. Uh, you know, he was our head coach. And, and I could spend hours just telling Coach Slavinsky jokes or stories because uh, he had a million of them. But, um, you know, track and field's actually, you know, a very unique sport in that, it, for the most part, it's very individual. Right. So you're running against the clock, you're throwing against, you know, distance, you're you're high jumping against uh, the high jump bar and you need to really come together as a team to win the meet. Right. So, you know, with that in mind, we trained a lot individually as the runners would go out and run their things. I, you know, I would work in the weight rooms or or doing jumping drills. You know, the weight guys would be in the weight room or or whatever. But um, you could always count on the team to come together the, the, on game day. And, and, you know, Walter Slavinsky was obviously a big part of that, motivating the team and getting everyone excited, telling his stories. Um, but yeah, no, I would, I, you know, I think uh, it was a great group of guys um, and have really fond memories. So in 1989, you won the NCAA indoor championship there in the high jump and Peter finished second in the weight throws. So you're obviously both there making that trip. Uh, Tell me about the NCAA championships that year, in particular the indoor uh, championships you both uh, did so well at. Yeah, so um, fond memories of that. Obviously, uh, we, we were really fortunate um, that year because nationals was actually held in our backyard, right? So it was at the the William Farley Fieldhouse at Bowdoin. Okay. Um, so Pete and I and a few others who qualified uh, for the nationals were able to uh, 
to drive down to Bowdoin and actually practice at the facility. So that, to me, that, you know, that was huge because, uh, you know, I went to eight nationals and, you know, all, all over the country. Um, and you never get the opportunity to actually, you know, train and, and practice at the event that you're going to do. You kind of just show up that day and, and, you know, get in whatever you can and hopefully have a good outcome. Um, so, you know, we also had the unfair advantage because it's 25 minutes away at Bowdoin, uh, because we filled the field house with, you know, all of our teammates hmm. who didn't qualify. Right. And then, you know, and then a whole bunch of our friends that drove down from Bates, cause like I said, it was 25 minutes away. So, you know, whenever I was competing or Pete was competing or some of the runners were competing, you know, the whole place just erupted cheering people on. And, uh, um, you know, that, that year actually set the national record. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it was just a really exciting time. My family was there. Pete's family was there as well. Um, you know, it was just really comfortable, which is important as an athlete, because you're always, you know, really excited about the NCAAs, but you got to maintain that level. Um, but, you know, it was obviously exciting at the same time. And, you know, I actually remember after the event was over, uh, going to, to dinner with Pete and his family uh, to celebrate. So it was really a great, great way for, for both of us to kind of finish our indoor track careers. Yeah, from what I've read, I mean, Pete, obviously, and his family, was, I, I read a, our story about another person who they, they invited them to dinner, and it seems like Pete was really outgoing uh, to everyone. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was just very uh, embracing, right? He's a very caring, inclusive person. He's always looked around the room to make sure everyone felt included, you know, which is which is one of the reasons that, you know, he was our, our, our you know, captain of the track team, right? And, and he was also very focused on whatever he did, right? So his approach to academics or athletics, it was always like 100% of the time. Uh, he would really never approach something with half measures. Um, and he could always take it on with a smile and, and that can-do attitude, which is great. You've touched on some of those personality traits. What else about him really stood out? The best way to find Pete was, you know, in, the, in this world, everyone knows there's, you know, there's givers and takers, right? And, you know, I try to surround myself with, people who are, who are givers. And, and, you know, Pete was always a giver. He always had time for his teammates, his classmates, his family. Um, you know, like I said, he was selected as captain of the track and field team for, for that reason. He, you know, he always put him, his team ahead of his own needs and he'd always be there to motivate people and, and, and try to get the best out of them when we were competing and, uh, and off the field as well. I mean, you know, he's just one of those guys where you just liked hanging out with him. And you're one of the supporters of the Peter Goodrich uh, Memorial Scholarship Fund uh, here at Bates, marking the 20th anniversary of, of 9-11. How did this effort come together? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, so I think it was back in February, um, I got an email uh, from his, his wife, Rachel, and she reached out to me. And she was, it was, it, it was an interesting email. I hadn't heard from her in a while. And she was really struggling with uh, the anniversary of 9-11 and, and, you know, and Pete's untimely passing. And, you know, we discussed the options and, and, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to help her reframe it, that it wasn't, you know, uh, an opportunity to mark his death, but rather really to celebrate his life. And I think once we kind of reframed the event to be a celebration, she really felt invigorated by that and really uh, engaged. And, you know, obviously uh, the whole class and everyone who Peter touched, um, you know, really gave him something to rally around. Uh, and it's just been phenomenal. I mean, uh, I know it's, uh, I think it's close to or over a quarter of a million dollars that people have given towards his, uh, his scholarship fund, um, which really is a huge statement to, to what Pete, Pete did in his life. Terrific. And then you can, can you describe a little bit, maybe the bond the class of 1989 in particular feels? I, I just get the sense that it's stronger than most uh, due to, you know, Pete's memory. There's no question in my mind that Pete's legacy was something that, you know, all taught everyone in our class how fragile life can be, right? So if you think about it, you know, we graduated in 89 uh, and, you know, here we are uh, 10 years later uh, or a little 12 years later and, uh, and you know, the tragedy around 9-11 hits. Um, so we're all pretty young. You know, I like to think I'm still kind of young, but I'm getting older every year, right? So, um, you know, so it just it just hit, struck a chord with everyone, right? That, you know, that life is fragile and Pete was an amazing person and, and to have his life taken like that was just, you know, tragic. So, you know, my unique experience with Pete was, was just that it was my experience. Right. But everyone who met Pete had their own unique story to tell. And I think that really um, added to the bond uh, and certainty, uh, you know, certainly made our class unique. Uh, and, you know, just, 
when I think of someone like uh, Captain J.J. Cummings, who's in our class too, mm-hmm. right? He He's a great friend of Pete. And, you know, he fought in the war uh, uh, after 9-11 in Afghanistan. And it was very personal for him. Um, and there's countless stories of the impact that Pete had on our class and in other classes in a positive way um, that for sure helped to, to form that unique bond. And then are there any other thoughts you wanted to share about Peter? We haven't discussed any stories you wanted to tell that um, we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, well, the, the story, you know, one of the things I thought about, uh, you know, when you reached out was, you know, uh, one story that, that came to mind was when we were both living in Adams and uh, and Adams had a pool table at the time. I don't know if it still does, but back then it did. And, you know, I never really spent that much time playing pool, but, you know, Pete was like everything. He was an expert and, you know, he would spend countless hours showing me, you know, the nuances of the game and not surprising as a math physics major, right? He was he would just he would break it down like on a math physics you know perspective and i'm a political science major so i had no idea what he was talking about but you know uh you know, he'd you know he'd break the game down by angles and what was physically possible and the trick shots and all that and you know so whenever i play pool i always think back to my times in adams and my you know my lessons with peter and and with really great fondness and you know that's who pete was and you know i miss him and and i miss our games at pool well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. And, um, and again, folks, you can support the uh, Pete Goodrich Memorial Scholarship Fund. Uh, information is on the, the Bates website. And Matt, thanks so much again. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Appreciate your time. Tuesday is an exciting day for the Bates community as four teams get their seasons underway, starting with men's soccer's 3.30 p.m. match against Maine Maritime Academy at Russell Street Field. We previewed both soccer seasons last week on the Bobcast. This week, we preview three more fall sports starting with volleyball, with the Bobcats traveling to Husson Tuesday for a match that gets underway at 6.30. First-year head coach Emily Hayes looks ahead to the season. The coaches at Bates have welcomed me with open arms along with all of administration. They're absolutely wonderful to work with, and it's been great to get to know them and learn the ropes from them. We have been working really hard in the gym, uh, but we've also been kind of balancing that with some team bonding and kind of mental training, big on the mental side of the game, as well as team building, understanding that, again, there is so much newness and we have to put a lot of focus into that teammateship and and all of those things. We were able to go to one of our players, Katie Sanchez. Her grandma has a camp. I had my first camp experience, and we spent the day out there having some real intentional team time along with uh, just having a blast and tie-dyeing and um, embracing Maine. I noticed Bates Volleyball really killing on Instagram right now. I really encourage everyone to follow Bates Volleyball. Tell me about that emphasis. Definitely. I mean, I think that uh, I'm really into doing everything with a championship mindset. And if we're going to have a social media page, let's have it and let's let it have the benefits that it does, whether it's connecting people from all over the world and the country uh, who can kind of tune in and see what we're doing, any updates, matches, things like that, but also just continuing to highlight the student athletes and what they're doing. This is all about them. Um, you know, with recruiting, obviously, it's a big help and a tool, uh, but really it just allows an open door into the culture of our team and our program. Your senior class, it's, it's small but mighty, if you will, right? You have uh, Brittany Fuller, you have, of course, Sydney Phillips, who has contributed a lot during her time here, and Megan Seabury also has played a lot. Uh, tell us about this group. All three of them are absolutely fantastic. Couldn't imagine the team without them. They each bring a different leadership style, which is great. Really complement each other well. Um, you know, Sid it brings a ton of power in the front row, and she's really embraced that growth mindset. Uh, making changes as a senior is hard, and she's really welcoming those uh, pieces of feedback and things along those lines to just continue to grow her game. Meg is a really, really steady force in the back row for us. She's a big leader back there, pretty dominant, uh, hungry for the ball. We've had some awesome conversations where she just wants to be pushed, and, and that's pretty awesome as a coach. And then Brett is just a really special person. She has been and someone who the underclassmen have been able to really look to and lean on. And she's really versatile, too. She's, uh, you know, in our try line in the back row, passing for us, playing some defense, but she also can set the ball pretty well and uh, just facilitate her hitters in a great way. So um, all three of them are really, really, you know, bringing their A game here to their last season. Do you enjoy kind of mixing and matching people in different spots on the court and experimenting a little bit? How's that been going? 
I am big on that, which may be a change for a lot of student athletes. You know, the game of volleyball is meant to, you know, uh, blur the lines and think outside the box. I, I am bought into, you know, whether it's a try middle offense or a different style defense that works specifically for our team. There have been a lot of changes that have gone on in alumni gym with our team. And again, they've been really receptive to that, which is great. But uh, yeah, really an outside the box thinker with that and also huge on the versatility piece. So asking a lot of people to do a lot of things uh, positionally that are pushing them outside of their comfort zones. And I was at first, the first practice the other day, um, well, a few weeks back now, I guess. But on the whiteboard, you had thankful written under practice one. Tell us a little bit about that. Definitely. Uh, gratitude is uh, huge for me. And Abby Wambach says, be thankful for what you have, but demand what you deserve. And, um, you know, I really, really appreciate kind of what she means by that. But we're super aware that we have so much to be thankful for here at Bates and wherever we are. So, um, you know, we start every meeting or practice or match with what we call thankful circle. And we all go around and talk about what we're thankful for. Uh, there was a study proven that you can transition more quickly from one mindset to another if you uh, verbally, if you express thanks out loud and so we do that and they'll remind me if I forget and get rolling jumping into a practice plan or something like that and it's a really really cool part to just stop and reflect in the midst of a go 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 society. It's really interesting because the team has had you know a fair amount of success the past few years winning seasons the past few years um, but at the same time you're almost starting from scratch because of the COVID year right because half this team first year sophomores are brand new right? Right. We talk a lot about how to determine success, and it's so easy in athletics to determine it by a win or a loss. Uh, but we're really trying to push ourselves there, whether it be strengthening our schedule or, um, you know, uh, crisping up our technique or things like that that might result in short term failure. Uh, what we see is going to result in long term success and growth. And so, uh, really buying into that mentality and not going the easy way towards wins, but really pushing ourselves uh, to be the most disciplined team, the most hardworking team, and the most selfless team. I think we talked before how you don't see much of a difference at all between non-conference and conference matches, even though you do have a fair amount of non-conference ones to get ready for NESCAC play, right? Right. We're going to play volleyball, whether yeah. it's uh, heading into a practice or a lift or a match, whatever it is, we're going to get better and grow as a team. And, um, you know, whenever we put on that Bates shirt, we take that really, really seriously, uh, that we're representing not only ourselves, but our team, our coaches, our institution. And, um, yeah, so, you know, what we really work to do in our gym is increase the intensity so that there's a smaller gap between uh, practice feel and match feel. And, um, you know, that way it's uh, just more embracing that stress when you walk into a match because you've lived it already. You've got a couple of assistant coaches who you actually inherited along with the uh, players as well. Tell us about Wyatt and Rob. Right, they're doing a great job, and it's hard. I've never had that experience as an assistant having a new head coach come in. Uh, and so, you know, props to them for both showing me the ropes with a lot of things that are bait specific, but also being open to a lot of changes and, you know, gathering that terminology and common language as we go along because we hit the ground running when I was hired here. We did not have a ton of time to go over philosophy, you know, and, and kind of elongate that process. We were uh, speedy through that. So they've been great. This might sound silly, but I think you have a new net, right? We, we do have a new net. Yes, Aaron. Uh, we've not used it much okay. uh, because it, it works with the main uh, right. one net setup. But, uh, but I mean, on that note, I will say we are so lucky with regards to the facilities that we have to have not one but two gym spaces where we can set up nets mm -hmm. if we need to. And um, definitely feel, feel great to be here and be an alumni competing and practicing. Yeah, an alumni gym, obviously a special environment, right? Right, super special. I haven't seen it full yet, no, but can't yet. <laughs> can't wait for that. I've seen the pictures and look forward to, you know, uh, putting on a good show, getting getting some fans out. Well, are your thoughts you wanted to share about the season we have upcoming here? Excited about it and just excited about what we're building here. It feels special when you are uh, you know, either working through a really tough drill or, um, you know, on the lake uh, at a camp with this team. It feels like we really, really are building this kind of unique family and really excited to just see uh, what we do next. All right, Emily Hayes, thank you so much for joining us on the Bobcast to preview the season. Thanks, Aaron. The number 20 nationally ranked Bates field hockey team opens its season Tuesday at 7 p.m. when the Bobcats host the University of Southern Maine at Campus Avenue Field. Ninth-year head coach Danny Kogut talks about the team's scrimmage last Saturday at Tufts and gives us a look at what to expect from the team this year. It was a really good opportunity for us to work on some of our 
more structural or set pieces that we have been working on this preseason. I think it's always a little bit different when you're going against an opponent that isn't yourself. So it was a really good opportunity for us to check in on some of those, um, recognize where we might need to make some fine um, tune improvements prior to our games this week and just kind of build on what we've been doing this preseason. I think some big takeaways is our fitness level was really good. Um, we definitely could sharpen up a couple of our set pieces, but it was at a place where we were happy given um, what we had done this preseason. Great. And then tell us about your team captains this year. Yeah, sure. So we have four captains this year. Um, Emily Genunzio is returning for uh, fifth year. She deferred last year to come back for a full season. So we're excited to have her back. Um, we have Ashton Bale, who's a defensive player. So Emily is a forward, Ashton's a, in the defense. Um, Riley Burns is playing our center mid this year. And then Grace Biddle is a goalkeeper. Um, so a really nice stagger down the field of leadership on each line, which will be really helpful, um, I think, as we progress forward. They're all very, I think, unique and independent in their leadership styles, but they mesh really well together. And I think they provide a good balance for the entire team. And speaking of, you know, you mentioned Grace Biddle, junior in goal. You also have Ellie Bauer, a senior. Tell us about your goalkeepers and what they bring to the table. Yeah, so we, and then we have Emma Volkers, who is a sophomore. Yeah. Um, so we have three really strong goalkeepers this year. They all did really well down at Tufts. Um, I think that they're all going to, they're all going to contribute in different ways this season. Um, but really strong goalkeeping. They're definitely unique in how they play. And so just finding the right goalkeeper for kind of our defensive style is something that we, we still need to do. But they all came in strong and ready to go. And you're, you were a goalie when you played, right? So um, you take a, I know you work with them a lot. So what, what, what's the approach you take when you work with them? The approach we take is we really look for proactive goalkeepers. So we want goalies who are controlling their defense versus reacting to our opponent. And so a big part of working with our keepers and trying to find the one um, that's going to, to mesh the best that season um, is going to be basically dependent on if they're able to control their defense in front of them and how confident they are with making those little adjustments in live play that lead to success. Because if they're communicating and they're forcing low angle shots um, or, or just poor shots because the shooter's under pressure and they make their job easy, that's a great thing. You know, when you see a di uh, goalie diving all over the place um, and making kind of these spectacular saves, it actually tells you that probably a lot went wrong um, for them in the to be in the position to have to do that. So we like goalkeepers who can keep it simple um, and set up their defense to make their job easy. And obviously this is a common theme for fall sports, but you haven't played since 2019 against other opponents. You finally get to for real uh, on Tuesday here, but um, the senior class, they remember it. The junior class, they remember it. The first years and sophomores don't. So what's, what's been the point of emphasis for the younger players who will surely, you know, need to contribute at some point this year, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it is a really interesting thing. And I think one thing we learned at Tufts is almost the speed of live playing games is just so much more intense and faster than you could ever imagine. And so it was a good mental check in for us that we we're doing well in practices, but we could push our tempo and pace even more um, to prepare for what game like game is going to be like. Um, so I think the biggest emphasis is they're all really talented, smart players, but they need to stay talented and smart at a faster pace. And that's the challenge um, in sport is can you perform faster than your opponent and think faster than your opponent. So that that's going to be a big one this year with two classes who haven't had college game time just because the college game is so much faster than the high school game. The good news is, though, it seems like looking at your roster, you have a sizable amount of juniors and seniors, right, to, to lead the way. Yeah, we do. And they are, they're really prepared um, for this season. They came in in great physical um, shape. They really worked hard over the last year. I think they've also stayed really in check with our team values and just preparing mentally for the season ahead. And so I think they will lead the program in a really special way this year, those juniors and seniors of just really knowing what we're about and how we want to play. Uh, on offense, just kind of looking at the numbers from 2019, that's the most recent ones we have. But, you know, Emily Giannunzio, you touched on her being the returning uh, leading uh, leading scorer for this team. Bridget Thompson, Riley Burns, uh, Paige Cody, Sarah Bustle. I mean, the, some of the top names from that year are back, right? Yeah, yeah, they're all back, which is really exciting. Um, and we had, so there's 
all those players you just named are doing wonderful and that attacking kind of forward uh, half of the field. Cammy Lambert came back ready to go this season. She worked really hard. So she's going to be a key um, person in that attacking line as well. And we also have a couple first years who are showing an incredible amount of like gutsy play, which we love to see. Um, and it can definitely throw a team off when you can put a player in there who's just going to give you five or seven minutes of just all out kind of um, gutsy play and, and going for balls that maybe, you know, it's a 50 50 at best. You have a non conference game on Tuesday before your NESCAC opener Saturday against Hamilton. Uh, the non conference game, do you expect to use a lot of different lineup combinations or are you, or you think you're pretty much set on that right now? Um, I think we want to settle in pretty quickly. You know, we like to develop lines and let them really get to know each other in the season. And so the sooner we can do that, the better. I think when you know the people around you and you know how they play, it's just a better overall team performance. So we're hoping to settle into those in the next week or two. Great. Well, any other thoughts you wanted to share about the upcoming field hockey season uh, we haven't got to talk about yet? Obviously, you know, entering the year in the national rankings after finishing in 2019, uh, it's almost like uh, you're hoping to pick up where you left off a little bit, right? Yeah, it's kind of funny because these rankings came out and you're like, OK, two years ago, we, we were all ranked somewhere and people are just throwing darts at boards, I think, for these rankings um, this year. But but. And our goals for this year to do better than in 19, you know, even though we didn't play in 2020, it's, it's not like we are, um, we lost our program or it's in a different place. I think we worked really hard in the off season. And so our goals are to come back and be stronger this year than we were in 19. And I think that's been our, our goal every year I've been here at Tufts and we've been able to see that steady progression over nine years. And I think now we're at a place where we are ranked in that top 20. And so um, improvements are, harder to come by and so you have to work harder for them and I really do think that we worked hard in the off season and we expect to improve on, on 2019 um, but we also know that that now we're not a team that's kind of like sitting in the background and sneaking up on people and so it's just a different playing style mentality. Great. Well, the Phil Hockey team opens Tuesday, 7 o'clock against Southern Maine, and then NESCAC opener at home as well, noon on Saturday against Hamilton. Danny Ryder, Koget, thank you so much for joining us on the Bobcast to preview the season. Thanks, Aaron. The football team does not start play this week. No, we have to wait until a week from Saturday for the Bobcats return to the gridiron. But it's never too early to preview the season. So we chatted with interim head coach Ed Argast, offensive coordinator Castavius Patterson, and defensive coordinator Keith Davis. Coach Argas, I want to start with you because you started your coaching career right here at Bates, right? Yeah, under 43 years ago. <laughs> 43 years ago yeah. under, under Webb, uh, Coach Webb Harrison. Yeah. Tell me about that experience breaking in at Bates and what's it like coming back now? Well, I was, so I was working for an insurance company. I was an adjuster. And uh, Mike Foley, who was our team captain at Colgate, called me up and said, hey, uh, I'm leaving here to go to Dartmouth, do you want this job? And I said, yes. And I got in the car and drove to Maine. <laughs> and uh, for me as a young coach, I got the opportunity to be around some really class human beings. Um, Webb Harrison, Bob Flynn, Chick Leahy, Dayton Mahal, and they were just showed me how to treat players and, and, and how to coach, you know, and how you can be demanding, but yet you can be kind. So. Uh, it was a great start for me. And Webb Harrison, of course, famously coined the phrase, it's a great day to be a Bobcat. That's it. Uh, what are some memories specifically of him working? Well, there? you know, he, he had this good, better, uh, the Marine thing. He'd say, yeah. good, better, best, never, never rest till the good get better and the better get best. So, uh, and he was just a good example. We, ma we maintained friends for years after, and he married, he remarried a woman uh, he met at my wedding. Oh. Yeah. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And then coming back to Bates, I mean, had that opportunity arise, and now obviously they're in, you're the interim head coach, but I know you were on the staff last year even though we didn't have a season. Right. Um, you know, I, I came to Maine, back to Maine, to work at UNA, which was a job I liked. Uh, but then an opportunity, I have two friends in the business, uh, Coach Hall and Coach Patterson, mm -hmm. and an opportunity to work with them came up, and, and uh I couldn't say no to that. So it was, and they did a lot to get me back here, and I appreciated it. So it just worked out. It was almost like a perfect storm. 
Well, speaking of Coach Patterson, let's bring you in here, Coach. Uh, I am curious, you know, looking at the offense just after, you know, just a few days of practice so far, what are your initial impressions of these guys? Um, right now, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with where they're at. I'm, I'm happy with the effort that they're making and the stride they're making. Uh, just like anything else, when you're in the early part of camp, you have a, a few minimal mistakes that we need to clean up, uh, just some, some sharpness with our detail assignments and alignments and type stuff like that. But I'm very impressed with where we're at as a group. I'm mostly impressed with their effort right now. I think the effort is great, but we just have some things we have to clean up from a, a detail standpoint and execution. Well, let's go unit by unit. Quarterbacks, Brendan Costa, it must be nice to have him um, back uh, here for uh, for a fifth season. Oh, yeah. I'll I, I tell you what, Brendan is one of the um, better players in the conference, uh, one of the better quarterbacks for sure. Um, it's, it's very nice to have him back, a kid that I've had the chance to work with over the last 36 months, uh, bringing him from a triple option kid all the way to where we're at right now. And he's made tremendous stride daily. He's proven, I think, uh, the last few practices have shown how far he's came from 2018 to this point. Uh, we're very happy that he made the commitment to come back to Bates and uh, to come back and play here and finish his career the right way when he could have went on and graduated and did something else with his life. But he wanted to come back and finish this thing the right way and uh, put Bates in a better position for the future uh, going forward. Um, I'm also happy with the fact that we, for the first time in, our, in my career here, that we have some depth. So we have four or five kids behind him that's got some playing experience or really, really talented kids. Uh, so I'm happy with the depth that we have at quarterback, which now gives us the freedom to be able to do some things to allow him to be able to play the kind of football that he likes to play without any restrictions. Great. And then the running back position, there's a lot of different guys who might get carries. I, I saw you moved um, Christian Oliveri to running back, right? That's kind of an interesting difference now. Oh, yeah. The Christian thing was one of those situations that we've been eyeing from the time he came here as a freshman in 2018. We just didn't have the luxury to do it at that time because we had so many running backs and wing backs that was on the roster that was left over from the previous staff. And we needed receivers. We was changing offense. And he was one of the more dynamic playmakers we have and one of the fastest kids we had. So he bought into quickest way to the field, which at the time his heart was at running back. But we have a philosophy that's quick way to the field. And we, we it, it made no sense to have a kid waiting behind four or five other backs when he could be one of the top three receivers on our team. And so he bought into the idea of getting out there and playing and one opportunity to to move back, the running back presented itself, which it did. That was a promise I made to him, and now we're getting a chance to live that promise, and, and he's making the most out of that opportunity, and, and he's doing some really good things there. Great. Any other guys who we can look to get carries this year? Yeah, I think uh, Caleb Bolden was a kid that started his career as a running back, and uh, we put him on defense his second year so we could become more athletic um, and stuff like that until we got a chance to recruit more athletes on the defense. Uh, an opportunity to bring him back over to the offense, presented himself this offseason too. So he's a kid that he's going to get a chance to pick up where he was at in 2018. Um, when he started his career as a running back, he's going to get a chance to come back over only because at the same time, that's the position that we're rebuilding at, we're reestablishing there. COVID and graduation has pretty much depleted that position. Mm. Um, so we had to get him back over from the defense, put him back on offense. And so right now, I think him and Christian is handling it pretty well for guys that haven't played that position since high school or their freshman year. They're doing really, really well at it. And Garrett Evans, who's a two-sport track kid who got a chance to finish 2019 and the two wins we had on the field as a starter, he's coming back and he's doing some really good things. And he's carved out a role for himself. And then we have a young freshman, uh, Jamil, who's doing some good things right now. He's just acclimated to the college game. Yeah. Well, then, uh, speaking of the two games you won there at the end of the 2019 season, I remember Jackson Hayes, Sean Bryant, a lot of touchdown catches there, wide receiver group, and they're back, right? Yeah. I'm very excited about that group. I'm, I'm very excited to, to see where they're at in, in the 10-team in the league here and where they fall at. I really like the unit. Uh, we still got some things to work on there, but I really like the where we're at with Sean Bryant, Jackson Hayes, and, and Muhammad. Those guys are a really good group of receivers. And I, and I really like all three or four of them. They, you know, they can do some things. They all bring something different to the table. Um, I'm excited to see their maturation, how they've grown the last three years. You know, those kids have been through a lot. They've been, you know, they've been through a lot. They've been through the pressure cooker. And, and now it's their time to see where they're at. And after all the experience of the last 36 months, to see where they're at right now. And I'm excited to see them compete because for the first time, they'll be among the oldest kids in the conference, not the youngest. Right. And you mentioned Muhammad Diawara. That was a great catch he made at a practice I was at off a tip ball for a touchdown. So it looks like he's um, maybe going to come to his own a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's having a really, really good camp. Uh, he's a kid right now we're challenging. Uh, we have him on the back end right now. Uh, because I felt like he needed to be pushed. We felt like as a staff he needed to be pushed. And he's answering the bell. You know, he's having a really, really good camp. Um, he, he's handling himself mentally well right now. He's sharp. He's being a leader. He's being motivated again. He's not even running with the first team right now. Mm. You know, we got him with the twos right now for a lot of different reasons. And the kid is answering the bell, and uh, we're happy where he's at.
Great. Well, we'll move to the Hogs, the offensive line. And Coach Argas, I saw you when I was at practice working a lot with them. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you've seen from the offensive line so far. I, I think as a group, they're fairly athletic. You know, we've got good size. Uh, they're fairly athletic. They're smart. You know, it's, it's – um, Everything you'd look for in a good offensive line, they have. They're 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 a close knit group. They like each other. Uh, they spend a lot of time around each other when they're off the field. So that I think that's important because there's a chemistry there, and and uh, and I think we can develop some depth too. Some of the younger kids are talented. And Quinn Wood, senior captain, who we mic'd up the other day at practice, he seems to be a real good leader, huh? No doubt. He's uh, Quinn is Quinn and and. Uh, and Eric Stevens, uh, those two guys, I'd go to war with them anywhere. Awesome. And Keith, let's bring you in here, talk some defense. Keith Davis, our defensive coordinator. We'll go unit by unit. Let's start on the defensive line. What do you guys got up front this year? Man, up front, uh, we have a solid group, a veteran group. Uh, we have Jack Ryan returning at the end. We also have Nolan Potter mm -hmm. returning as well. Um, this may be the first year in a long time where I, I feel like we have great depth. Uh, we have a young guy who uh, came in and Finn Duffy. Mm -hmm who is a dominant nose tackle, plays hard, plays fast, and gives a tremendous effort. And then uh, behind him as well, we also have Alex Zanino, mm -hmm. who's a great player at the end, comes off the ball with speed, plays hard, and also gives a, a great effort. So um, this year I feel pretty strong up front. Um, I said we have a veteran group who are leading the way, um, helping those young guys learn and align right day in and day out, and um, I'm excited about it. Are we looking at 4-3, 3-4? Three, three, are we looking at in terms of scheme, perhaps? Uh, scheme-wise, scheme it's uh, – Interchangeable, okay. man. I said we have a very deep D line group, um, and I feel like we can go ones, twos, or threes. Uh, I think all those guys can play. Mm -hmm. um, um, we're gonna do a great job this year of getting all those guys on the field and, and different type of packages. Linebacker position, obviously Tony Hooks made a big impact uh, his first year on campus. Uh, what are you seeing from the linebackers? Oh uh, man, those guys, man, it, it's great to have those guys back, man. Uh, they went home this past summer and they worked their butts off, came back bigger, stronger, and faster. Um, there again, we have a veteran group who is fast. They play with speed, they play with speed, uh, and they love to hit. Uh, with Tony Hooks on returning, he was one of our top tacklers last year. Um, is a, is a great to have. Um, he should be one of the best linebackers in the conference this year. And then not just him, we have Mike Bowman right. returning, Spencer Adams, and we have Tyler Hamilton returning. Um, those guys are, are all great players. Play fast, they play hard, and um, I think they're going to make a lot of plays this year. Um, and then just just depth wise, having George Hawkins, having having Reza Badi. And um, as well, um, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be a great fit for us when just allowing us to change up some packages, play faster, and just get those guys around the ball m more often. Moving to the secondary, speaking of some experience there, obviously Anthony Costa, uh, we, we have Brendan Costa at quarterback, Anthony Costa on defense. Um, he returns for a fifth year, and there's some great experience in the secondary, isn't there? Oh, uh, there is some great experience back there. Um, I can tell you one thing, uh, uh, Anthony Costa has been amazing. Um, since he's got here, he preached accountability and detail and just, just stand focused day in and day out. He's been a great leader across the board, not just to the defensive backs, but the linebackers and plus the D-line. Um, he set a great example, a great, a great example. Um, but not just him, we're, we're returning Owen Straley, we're returning Muhammad Kulabali, and we're also returning um, Tom Formas. Right. Those four guys I think will lead the way. I think they'll be big time players and they'll make some big time plays this year. I said, they're focused and they're ready to make an impact. Uh, they're ready to show teams in the league. That, that, that they can hang, and they are some big-time players. Um, but not just those guys that I said. We have some young guys coming up who, who I think will make a, a great impact. And uh, Anthony Morton, um, Jaron Sato we have as well, and then also um, Quinn K. Uh, those guys are, are, are a great, great, great two deep guys. Um, they'll be able to rotate in a lot and uh, play a lot for us, so I'm excited. Yeah, I remember Tom Formas against Hamilton made that big hit, right, on special teams. So, guys, got some guys on special teams who can make some plays too, right? Uh, uh, we definitely do. Uh, Tom Formas is a game changer. Yeah. Um, um, when he's on specials, uh, uh, he gives a great effort. And then not just not just Tom Formas, but I can tell you guys about Archie Green mm -hmm. and Simon Redfern. Those guys can kick the ball. Yeah. They can kick the ball. They are they are the core when it comes to special teams. Those guys, we, we, we follow those guys. They lead us on specials. And uh, I think those guys are going to do a great job this year. Green punter, Redfern and kicker, is that what we're looking yes, for? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Those guys are actually interchangeable. Okay. Interchange. Hey, when you see those guys kick, look, <laughs> they're amazing right now. So that's probably going to be the uh, the uh, toughest part is that is that you want to get both those guys on the field because um, they can both kick well. So I think they're both going to have a great year this year. 
Excellent. Well, then, uh, Coach Argus, let's wrap this kind of interview up with you a little bit. Maybe some final thoughts you have on, you know, being the interim head coach and what's the experience been like so far, what some of your goals are for the team, you know, this season. Well, the, the team's impressed me with their, their attitude, you know, and, and, you know, you say attitude is everything, and these kids take that to heart. And uh, they show up every day, uh, smile on their face, ready to work their tails off, and that's what, and then they go work their tails off. It's not just talk. So, um if we keep having good practices and keep doing good things, good things are going to happen. Um, they're an easy group to coach. I got a lot of respect for them because it hasn't been easy for this group. And uh, so, you know, it's we're, we're looking forward to playing an opponent. Sounds good. Coach Argas, Coach Patterson, Coach Davis, thank you so much for joining us on the Bobcast. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, sir. Next time on the Bates Bobcast, we'll continue to get you geared up for football season as we catch up with fifth-year senior quarterback Brendan Costa, plus a recap of the first week of action for Bates Fall Sports. That's next time on the Bates Bobcast.